that would be uh, useful. And there's somebody else who wants to come into the. There you uh, go. Meeting. Yeah, we'll get some people. Stra we'll get yeah, some. Yeah, sure. Here, here they all come. They're all. Uh, we got all the stragglers slowly uh, coming in. So yeah, so I want to introduce you to uh, Bruce Firestone. Uh, for my Canadians in the group, you'll probably uh, most be excited to hear that he brought the kind of modern day Ottawa Senators back and was the owner of that uh, club. And you also own the uh, Ottawa Rough Riders football club at uh, one point as well. Yeah. Uh, but he's also a real estate developer. He's a professor. He's done a lot of stuff. And so I thought I'd bring him here uh, today, not just to talk about hockey, is, uh, but also to talk about some real estate and what he sees uh, you know, happening right now uh, in, the, you know, in these crazy COVID times of ours. So Bruce, I'm gonna let you take the stage and it's all yours, buddy. All right. Thanks so much, uh, Mike, for inviting me. And hi, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm in Ottawa, Canada today, um, uh, minus 18 or minus 19 Celsius. So pretty, pretty cold, but sunny. And, um, and I guess I, I really like the cold weather. Um, today, I'm going to talk about um, a couple of things that are really important to me. And that is, uh, how do you take care of yourself and your family for three generations? And, um, you know, you're going to hear a little bit of my story, which has some ups and has some downs in it. And so you're going to hear the first part of my uh, talk is about uh, is about my story and, and those ups and those downs. And then what I learned from that, how to take care of myself and my family for three generations. And, uh, you know, as uh, Mike said in the introduction, and thanks again for that kind introduction, Mike, you know, I've been a hockey guy. I've been a real estate developer. I've been a university professor. I've done a lot of different things. And I, I think most people today are going to have anywhere from three or four uh, careers to probably eight or nine. You know, so I think we are all of us going to do some different things as uh, as time uh, goes on. And over that period of time and over a lifetime of experience now, there's only two things that have worked for me and my family in terms of, you know, pr providing for ourselves. And that is real estate investment and owning what I call a PB4L. What the heck is a PB4L? It's a personal business for life. So those are the things that we're going to get to. And I'm going to show you some models. The models, the business models that I'm going to talk about, some of them will be business and some of them will be real estate, because I know some people on the call are real estate uh, men and women. And some people are, of course, interested in the business side. So we're going to do a little bit of both. Uh, so I'm going to go back in time. Um, so, Joy, as you know, I was in Australia. I lived in Australia for many years, uh, first in, in Sydney, working for the New South Wales government. And I did a master's of engineering science uh, at the University of New South Wales while I was working. So I did it part time. And then I got invited to do a, a Ph.D. in urban economics at the Australian National University in Canberra. And as I said uh, to Joy before we started uh, uh, recording this session, um, <laughs> You know, going from Sydney, Australia to Canberra was a really, uh, you know, it was like trading down. Ottawa was kind of a government town, too, where I live. But uh, Canberra is so boring, it makes Ottawa look like Paris, Joy. So there you go. So there I was at the Australian National University doing a little bit of teaching, doing some research, uh, studying for my Ph.D., and the gentleman on the screen here is my dad, Jack Firestone, Professor O.J. Firestone, uh, who's unfortunately long since passed away. But uh, my dad came to see me when I was living in Canberra. And my wife and I, we only had one kid at that time, but we have five now. So dad came to see me in Canberra and said his business in Ottawa was having trouble. And could I come back for just six months? He said, just six months. And um, I said, uh, uh, okay, Dad, I will. And that was 35 years ago. So I came back to Ottawa. And what did I find that uh, my dad was, was doing? He and uh, three uh, partners uh, had uh, bought or built, actually built, six roller disco rinks. I didn't even know. I, I bet you nobody on this call knows what a roller disco rink is. I didn't know. I, I do. I do. I remember that. <laughs> Mike, you are not old that. enough to remember that. I still go. <laughs> That's all good. right. Okay. No way. I'm not believing that at all because I don't, I don't even know if they exist. Anyway, I did. I don't even know if there was uh, disco music in uh, in Australia. So anyway, I came back uh, supposedly for six months. Um, excuse me for a second, Lori. Uh, do you mind uh, turning off your your camera? I know you're driving. It's just flicking in my eyes like that, and I'm going to have a seizure in a minute. Uh, so anyway. So I came back and I found my dad had invested in six roller disco rings. These are huge buildings. They're like 45,000 square feet, uh, about an acre under a, a roof, all in one level with no columns. Quite, quite nice buildings, actually. So I go in there. I'd never been. I, I rent a pair of roller skates and you, you go on the floor and the music plays, you know, Donna Summers play or something. 
and you skate in a circle. And then after a few minutes, the music stops and everybody stops. So I stopped. And then the music starts up again and you go in the other direction. And so after about an hour of this, I took off my roller skates. I thanked the rental agent. And the next day I went to see the three fellows uh, who uh, were partners with my dad. And I said, um, I am prepared to trade um, a ha our half interest in the operating company uh, for your half interest in the real estate. I know something about real estate, having a PhD in ur urban economics, having done a civil engineering degree. And maybe I know a little bit, about, but I don't know anything about roller disco, except, uh, which I didn't tell them as I hated it. I thought it was terrible. But anyway, so, okay. so they said, oh, Bruce, uh, you know, these guys were in their 40s. I was in my 20s. So these guys said to me, uh, oh, we don't want to take advantage of, you know, the roller disco business. It's a cash cow. And, you know, the, the real estate's, you know, kind of boring and makes just a little bit of money. But the, the roller disco business, man, we're, we're raking in the cash. I said, you keep the cow. I'll take the real estate. So uh, they reluctantly <laughs> agreed because they felt sorry for me. And so we made that trade. 18 months later, the roller disco fad just died. You couldn't pay a teenager to go to one of these places. Uh, so, so there I was. Now we owned 100% of six huge buildings that were totally empty. Um, but this was the 1980s, guys. And again, you probably won't know this trend either, but there was a big management thing going on at that time. You know, it was like a fad, I guess you'd say, called MBWA. I can never get those initials right. Uh, management by wandering around. And what it meant, and I, I think there's some merit to it, is that the best meetings that you have are the ones where you meet uh, by accident at the water fountain, at the coffee machine, at the photocopier. Somebody said, I don't know who, somebody said uh, that the importance of a meeting is inversely proportional to the number of people who come to that meeting. And I think there's some truth in that too. So so what, what was happening is the tech scene in Ottawa and California and around the world was starting to really happen in a big way. You know, Apple was coming out with the little tiny, uh, what are the, were they, the little Macs back then. They, um, and a lot of exciting things were happening. And so these tech guys all wanted to have one level where the, you know, the product managers, the, uh, the HR people, the marketing people, everybody was, you know, management, uh, ownership, uh, the founders were all in one level. So they could just wander around and see everybody and sort of interact in a, a, a serendipitous way. Um, a few years later, uh, when I became involved with the National Hockey League, this is a picture of Gary Bettman, the commissioner, as a younger man. I think uh, this was right when he became commissioner, so about 30 years ago. I found out that uh, the National Hockey League had not one, not two, but three head offices, one in Montreal, one in Toronto, and one in New York. And I said to, uh, to Gary when he became commissioner, I said, Commissioner, you know what MBWA uh, is, right? You really need to have one office. I mean, I'm a proud Canadian, but uh, I said, Gary, you really have to centralize operations and make sense to put them in New York. And that's what they did so that the commissioner could wander around one building and, and sort of meet everybody. So that was the big thing back then. Um, uh, th these are pictures of me I put in here because I just got a kick out of it. You know, I was young once. Um, and this is me as a young uh, student in Australia and, uh, you know, drinking a beer. That's my youngest son, Andrew, when he was born. And, you know, I was a little scruffy looking, what have you. And uh, once I got back to Ottawa, being Canada and being a little bit more, uh, you know, uptight, I guess you'd say, uh, I had to sort of clean up. So I had to shave off the beard and, and okay. And no comments about how long, young I look there and how old I am now. <laughs> We're talking 30 or 40 years ago now. So be with me. So this still is a baby, picture. still a baby. Oh, <laughs> you're so nice. But anyway, this is my dad, my youngest son, Andrew, and this is me. So I had to clean myself up and rebrand the company. And, and I did that. And it was called Terrace Investments Limited, the first parent company of the Sense. Now, I want to show you the power of real estate. I mean, I didn't really know all of this stuff. You know, education takes you a certain distance, right? I mean, Mike, you know that. Education takes you to a certain point, but then you have to do some learn, learn by doing, right? There, there's, there is, you need experience too. And I didn't really understand all of this coming out of all the education that I was able to get. Hey, Bruce, I'm going to pause you just for one second. Sure. Michael Matthews said he can't see your screen. Can everybody else see his? Because I can see his screen perfectly. Can you guys all see his screen? So, Michael, I think it's your computer. So, I don't know if you want to log off and back on again. Because uh, everybody else. Joy, can, see it. Joy, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. And what are you seeing right now, Joy? Uh, your spreadsheet. 
Okay, like perfect. Okay. I, I, I just about freaked out. I, I was talking to myself <laughs> here. My I see it perfectly. So, so Michael, okay. just re, re, uh, reset your computer and come back yep. in it. To, yep. Hopefully, it'll be fine. And, and Mike, can you do something else too? If anybody has any questions as I go along, just put them in the chat box. And Mike, just put your hand up like this. I'll stop and we'll answer. I like I like making it a conversation if possible. So Joy, Lori, uh, Guadalupe, uh, Baron, <laughs> everybody on the call here, uh, if you don't mind, if you have a question, put it in the chat box. Mike will stop me and, uh, and, and I'll try and answer it as best I can. It's just better, you know. I mean, I, I've done a lot of teaching, as you'll see in this, uh, you know, as I recount my story. So anyway, so we had these huge buildings um, uh, that were empty, and within about uh, uh, 10 months or so, I had filled them all up with these wonderful tech companies. And you can see, if, can you see my screen, uh, my uh, cursor moving around, Mike? Yeah, you bet. Okay, good. So these companies were paying about $18 per square foot per year triple net, which is a decent uh, rental rate back then. It still would be decent today. Which meant that we had net operating costs on these six buildings of about just under $5 million a year, a lot more than we were making with the roller disco. And back then, the cap rates that applied to this, uh, cap rates are really just a return on investment, were about 8%. So if you divide your net operating company, uh, net operating income by your cap rate, you get a fair market value for these buildings of about 60 or $61 million dollars. We built them, it was on our books for about 37 or $38 million. So if you can build up the income in your portfolio, whether it's commercial or it's a residential portfolio, same calculations, guys. So it doesn't matter if this was an apartment building, a triplex, a duplex, or in this case, six former roller disco rinks. So um, there I was, I got an appraised value of almost $61 million on these buildings. I was able to put a new mortgage in place, this is the 80s, 75% loan to value. So it means that by paying out the original cost, we were able to put over $13 million in cash in our jeans. 13 million bucks. You know, I was probably 28. And $13 million back in the 80s would probably be equivalent to 30 or 35 million today. So all of a sudden, I realized the power of real estate uh, as it goes up in value, as uh, perhaps mortgages go down, it opens up room for refinancing, and it's income tax free. Most people say, oh, no, no, you got to pay uh, money. That's $13 million of cash you got. No, it's just a loan. You know, banks have a nasty habit of wanting you to pay that money back. So it's just, it's just cash. So what did I do next? So uh, I built office buildings. This is the um, uh, the Lawrence Center, the Royal Bank Pavilion, built lots of plazas, retirement residences. I don't know how many subdivisions I did, but I did both commercial, industrial, and residential subdivisions, built more than 1,200 uh, uh, homes as well. Um, uh, I, I built lots of operating businesses too. I, I was a restless guy, and one of the things that I, I will pass on to you guys today <laughs> is that when I do some coaching and mentoring and teaching today, especially for a lot of the young people on the call, I, I, I do encourage them not to do what I did, which is, you know, if I, if I found something interesting, I would do it. And today, what I think is perhaps a better approach is to find one thing that you're really good at, that you really like doing, create a great business model and focus on that and just build that, that business model over and over again. It's like make, making sausages, but that wasn't my career. Uh, so I like the mini storage business, so I build a mini storage uh, uh, business. Uh, I like the building office buildings. I like the mini office business. Today it's called co-working spaces, but we own the largest uh, uh, co-working uh, um, uh, business in eastern Ontario. And, uh, you know, so if, it was, if I wanted to do it, I just did it. Uh, built uh, gas stations, banks. I don't know how many McDonald's restaurants I built, but I think 16 or 18 of them. <laughs> Lots of shopping centers you can see down here at the bottom. So I was pretty busy. Um, and, 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 you know, while I was at it, um, you know, my wife and I were building a family. Uh, we had one child uh, leaving Australia, and, and then we all of a sudden we had five, including four under three. We had a set of twins in there. So we had four kids at one time in diapers. And so uh, one of the things uh, I did was I, I created my own lake. I had an old sand pit that I bought, and um, uh, I got permission from the Ministry of Natural Resources to go down instead of out. And by digging down, uh, there were lots of underground springs in, a, in you know in sand and water moves. And so we created this incredibly beautiful freshwater lake. It took 17 years. And one of the things I wanted to say to everybody 
is another, I think, important lesson I guess I've learned and I wanted to pass on to you guys today is people ask me over and over again, Bruce, you created your own lake. How much did that cost? That is the wrong question. The right question is how much money did you make when you built that lake? That's the way entrepreneurs think. They think always, how do I turn a cost center into a profit center? Well, let me tell you, I sold 1.1 million tons of sand, some of it at $1.05 a ton for backfill and cable laying and foundations. But some of it was approved for golf course top dressing and sand, uh, you know, the sand traps. And for that, I was getting 20 or $21 a ton. So you can add up the numbers for yourself. Uh, you know, people were paying really good money for the, the product. And it left behind this incredibly beautiful uh, lake, uh, which I still own to this, this day. And I stocked it with largemouth bass. Here are some of my boys, uh, you know, fishing in the early days. I had lots of kids there. And one summer I was bored. So I built this heritage barn. It was just a playpen for my kids. We used to go in there and watch Blue Jays games. And this is, I mean, it's like a 4,000 square foot barn with a loft in it and 30 foot ceiling heights. And uh, my kids would, you know, literally they would party in there. And of course, later on when they became teenagers, it was even more fun. Um, I started a newspaper. No, I didn't like the local newspaper, so I started my own. It was called originally Ottawa Business News, and, and uh, um, it's now it's still going strong, Ottawa Business Journal today. So when I took over the company from my dad, um, that was 1983, it was doing about $350,000 a year in volume, not very much. And uh, by 1992, we were doing about $120 million a year in volume in all the different things that that we were involved in it was it was quite profitable too you know typically we'd make a 10 to 15 percent margin so we're making 10 or 12 or maybe 50 million dollars a year um but you know you probably have already figured out i'm a restless guy so i said gee what do i do next you know what's my encore um i'm getting close to 40 which back then i thought oh my god that's really old now that i'm 69 i don't think so but back then i did and uh so I asked myself, you know, how do you, I should compare Ottawa to a, a bigger city and look what maybe a bigger city close to us has that we don't have. And I asked myself, well, what does Toronto have that, that Ottawa doesn't? And the answer was, uh, they have a zoo and I'm not too interested in animals. So I said, no, I'm not gonna build a zoo. They have the Princess of Wales Theater. Ah, that probably doesn't make any money. Um, and they said, wait a second, they got the Toronto Maple Leafs. And, uh, and I said, well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, they have an NHL team. Oops. Uh, so uh, back then I was working with uh, a wonderful, wonderful group of m very young people, including two of my key guys, uh, Randy Sexton and Cyril Leader. Randy was an MBA from Clarkson in the States. And Cyril Leader was uh, um, a CA, chartered accountant. So after, we used to play uh, pickup hockey in the old Lions Arena. You can see it here, a very old arena. And we used to go play pickup hockey a couple of times a week. They were much better than I was. But anyway, uh, after a, a game, I said to Randy, so hang back, I got, I got something I want to tell you. And they did. And they said, well, what is it? I said, you know, I think the NHL is getting ready to expand again. This would have been, I think, 1987 or 88. And, uh, and, uh, and they said, well, that's interesting. And uh, I said, you know, I think Ottawa was getting to the size where it could support a National League team. And I said, well, that's interesting. And then I said, you know what? I think we should be the bidders. And Randy, who's a you know, gung-ho kind of guy, you know, MBA type, type, he gets up right away and goes, yeah, man, let's do it. Like, that was it. And Cyril, who's a CA, you know, an accountant, uh, much more cautious, said, well, wait, wait a second, Bruce, how much is it going to cost? And I said, I don't really know. I think about 35 million US dollars. Because that's what NBA expansion franchises are going for, or were going for back then. I think now the NBA is talking over two billion for an expansion franchise, but back then they were going for about thirty-five million. So I said, I think Cyril, thirty-five million. But it turned out it was a bit, bit more. It was fifty million, and and today uh, even the NHL fees are, are quite a bit higher. I think six hundred and fifty million for for uh, Seattle. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So. So, uh, of course, Cyril was still saying, well, okay, Bruce, that's, that's great. How are we going to pay for it? So, aha, I have a plan for that, too. Um, and just for the hockey fans here, if we have a few, I know Joy is a fan, so for the hockey fans here, 
the Ottawa Senators actually played in the National League uh, from the inception of the league until 1933. And they won uh, nine or 10 or 11 Stanley Cups. So they, they have a great history. But there was a great depression in the 1930s. Uh, and, and what we're going through right now is actually quite comparable in some ways. Um, and they stopped play um, in 1933. So they hadn't played a game. The Senators hadn't played a game in close to 60 years. So our you know, call to action was bring back the Ottawa Senators because they were uh, an NHL team back in the day. And I had a very simple plan on how to do that. And for the real estate guys here and the business guys, here's the plan. So I said to Cyril and Randy, let's go out and buy 600 acres of land on the Queensway, Highway uh, 417, the major highway going through Ottawa, kind of bisects Ottawa. And th this uh, concept, by the way, it has been used by many others since, but I think this was kind of new back then. So I said, let's buy 600 acres of land, put a major uh, a community facility, uh, uh, an arena in the middle of it with an NHL expansion franchise, keep a hundred acres that we needed for this building, which you can sort of see here in red, and sell off the other 500 acres because the value of the land will, will increase, at least I think so. So we bought 600 acres in the west end of Ottawa in a, a small community called Canada. And, and so that was the plan. We were going to, uh, we bought it for $7.2 million, which is 12,000 an acre. And I was going to take the extra 500 acres hopefully it would go up by $100,000 an acre. And if you multiply those two numbers out, you conveniently get 50 million bucks. So sell off the extra land, put it in armored uh, trucks like this, ship it down to uh, New York City, give it to uh, John Ziegler and, and Gary Bettman at the National Hockey League and get an expansion franchise. That was the plan. And that really is a form of bootstrap capital or self-capitalization. It is a vastly under-researched and vastly underestimated form of financing. And I do a lot of that in real estate, a lot of that in business. It's not just for NHL teams, but it is the hardest thing, Mike, that I teach. I can give a three-hour lecture. By the way, I don't do three-hour lectures. I'm not keeping everybody for three hours. But back in the day when I, I was teaching, I would do a two and a half to three-hour lecture on self-financing. And, the, you know, case after case after case. And I, I really found this was very, very hard to for students to understand that there are other means of financing businesses, startups, not for profits, other than just having rich uncle buck give you a million dollars. Okay. But anyway, so this is a form of bootstrap capital. So put the money from the sale of the extra and surplus land in these trucks, take it down. Now, this is a picture again, no comments about how young I look there and how old I look today. Uh, this is me in the center. There's uh, my right-hand person, sort of leader. There's Randy Sexton and the rest of it. And I wanted to show you this picture, not just because these were good-looking young people back in the day, but just to tell you, you don't need a huge number of people to change your world. That This was the core group that, that built Terrace from a a really small company to a $120 million a year company in nine years and founded, uh, uh, you know, brought back uh, the Ottawa Senators uh, to play in the National Hockey League. If you have the right people with the right motivation and the right skills, you can do incredible things. I think the Prophet Muhammad came out of the deserts of Saudi with six followers, and I think Jesus had 12 disciples. And you, you wouldn't say that they didn't change the world. They changed the world in, in major ways. So you don't need you know, a, a, a cast of thousands to, to change the world. Just a, a few very, very smart, very dedicated, talented uh, people can make a huge difference. And that was what, one of the lessons I learned. So, so think about this. We had sold 15,000 season tickets for a team that didn't exist. Uh, we had 500 corporate sponsors all paying, you know, big money to sponsor a team that didn't yet exist. Uh, we had a uh, plan to sell off 500 extra acres for $50 million. Um, we had spent uh, at least two and a half million dollars on the bid and, uh, and a bunch of money on, on some land. And then we go down to Palm Beach where the NHL is having its winter meetings. And, um, and at, just the night before we actually did get the franchise, Mike, uh, the NHL has what they call an NHL family dinner. Uh, an NHL family dinner is a dinner with about 600 people there. 
And at that dinner, there were all these bidders who were trying to, who were vying for an NHL expansion franchise, Ottawa, Tampa, St. Petersburg, uh, Milwaukee, um, uh, Houston, Seattle, Hamilton. Uh, there were a few others I'm, I'm forgetting. And so we're, you know, I'm there with my group. I had 120 people with me down in Palm Beach. You know, everybody's like, bring back the senators, you know. And uh, we, we even had, you know, the fire department marching band, you know, playing tunes. I mean, it was crazy. Uh, and uh, we plastered every taxi and every elevator with bring back the senators. So, you know, bumper stickers, they were, we were everywhere. And one of the members of the Board of Governors comes up to me midway through this big dinner and says, uh, Mr. Farst, I want to tell you one thing. I said, you know, he's a voter. you got to be polite. Yes, sir. And he puts his face really close to mine. And he says, I'm just going to tell you one thing. You will never, ever, ever get a franchise in Ottawa. Whoa. So, I mean, I was very taken aback. Uh, you know, I got to remember I was still pretty young. And, uh, and this gentleman is still a member of the board of directors 30 years later. And I said to him, I, I think you should uh, reconsider that. I said, I think the NHL should give uh, franchises to people who love hockey, who love the National League, who will take care of the franchise, and that would be Ottawa. I'd ask you to reconsider. And he said, you've heard what I had to say. And he walks away. Whoa. So I go back to our table, you know, and I sit there and I'm kind of stunned. You know, we have sold season tickets and, you know, we've raised lots of sponsorship money and, you know, more bootstrap capital and, and uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people locally were running to their radios every every hour for updates. And I'm thinking, oh, man, if we don't get this franchise, I'm going to have to find a new hometown starting like maybe tomorrow. And uh, so Cyril comes over to me and says, uh, so uh, what's wrong? You know, because I was just kind of stunned. I said, well, nothing. Everything's good. Randy comes up and I said, no, every, everything's fine. You know how when men get <laughs> under stress, maybe their voice goes up an octave or two. And so finally, Norm Green, who is a good friend, and he was the owner of the Minnesota North Stars, which are now the Dallas Stars, and comes over and asks me what's wrong. And I, I told him. And um, I remember what he told me. He said, get that schmucky look off your face, kid, and get out there and hustle. That's one vote you're not going to get, maybe. Go out and get the rest of them. So I went, my God, you know, <laughs> Norm is right. I got to get on with this, you know, what the heck? So anyway, so the next morning, you know, as entrepreneurs, most of us, um, almost all entrepreneurs get up early. So at six o'clock the next morning, we're down at the, uh, uh, you know, in the breakfast room at the Breakers Hotel in Palm Beach. The, if you've ever seen the movie, Mike, you ever see the movie The Shining with Jack Nicholson? Oh, a long time ago. Before you were born, I saw that movie. Okay, good for you. Yeah. So, so the over uh, this the, the Breakers Hotel kind of looks like the Overlook. It's spooky and scary, and so uh, you know, uh, it's just it's a creepy place. I must say, I, I hope nobody is taking offense from that, but it is pretty creepy. So anyway, we go down uh, to to the uh, breakfast room, and I look around, and there's all the members of the board of governors having breakfast before their uh, their you know, big meetup and it starts at eight o'clock and uh, there's Phil Esposito from Tampa. Uh, he was representing the Tampa Bay Lightning and there's me, but where were all the other bidders? Where was Hamilton, Milwaukee, Seattle, Houston, Portland? Uh, you know, nobody else was there. I thought, uh, this is great. So for the next two hours, we, you know, both Phil and I could see Phil moving around the room and me moving around the room, telling people, remember Ottawa, why you should uh, pick Ottawa. Uh, I, this is a picture that they took of me, by the way, the night before when I, I heard the uh, you'll never, ever, ever get a, a team in Ottawa. So I thought I'd put that in there. I was pretty upset. But anyway, um, interestingly enough, at one o'clock in the afternoon, the NHL uh, calls a press conference. And um, I had been out for a run. I like to, to jog a little bit. And so I came back at literally five minutes to one. And my staff told me the NHL has made a decision. I said, what decision? We don't know. We're told to be in our suite at one and NHL security will come and, and, and get us. So I go up uh, to the, uh, the suite and I don't have time for a shower. I just had to sort of towel off and get in my suit. And then NHL security takes us down a back stair into the basement of this, you know, spooky hotel. And there I am with Cyril Leader, Randy Sexton, uh, Elliot Richardson, who was the former attorney general of the United States, who was our U.S. Uh, legal attorney. Uh, Gary Burns from Pete Myrick Thorne and uh, Mayor Jim Durrell from Ottawa. So there we are uh, in the basement right next to the uh, uh, prep kitchen. You know, there are potato peelings and garbage everywhere. The pipes are dripping on us. And I go, oh, 
this is bad. <laughs> you know, I, I think, holy smokes, we're, we've obviously been shuffled off to the worst part of the hotel. And uh, so I turned to my group and I said, it, uh, I'm very proud of, of, of you guys and all of the work we've done. We couldn't have done any more. Uh, it looks like today we are not going to be successful. And, and that was a tough moment for, for our group, for sure. But I said, we're going to be uh, polite and we're going to thank the NHL for allowing us to, to, to bid in this process. Uh, we're not going to take no for an answer. We're going to have our own press conference as soon as the news breaks that we were not successful. Uh, we'll have our own press conference and we'll say, look, we weren't successful today. Uh, there may be some issues that we have to address. But there'll be another set of winter meetings next year. We're going to come back and we're going to bring back the senators next year. That's what we're going to do. We're not going to take no for an answer. And that's another thing I would like to emphasize for you. And I learned that from my, my dad, and I'll pass it on to you, that, that successful entrepreneurs don't like to hear no. And they don't easily take no for an answer. And that would be true of me. And I suspect a lot of people on this call and probably Mike as well. Anyway. So one o'clock, um, we're waiting there. And what I didn't realize, Mike, was that the losers were upstairs on the ground floor where the media could see them mm -hmm. and the winners were hidden. I, I didn't know that. I just assumed that, oh my God, here we are in the crappiest part of the hotel. We're, we're losers. So they bring us up to the NHL um, uh, Board of Governors room and I, they bring me in and uh, my group in. And um, I go up to the front of the table and there in front of me, I see a piece of paper that says, the NHL is pleased and proud to announce today that conditional franchises have been granted to the cities of Ottawa and Toronto, uh, Ottawa and Tampa. And uh, I said, oh my God, we just won this thing. And it was a really wonderful moment. You know, Randy Sexton jumped 30 inches, his uh, vertical was maxed out at 30 inches, was incredible. I, I was pretty teary eyed, I have to say, and, and we were pretty happy. And I turned to the then president, you can see him here on the screen, John Ziegler, and I asked John, oh, what was the vote for Ottawa? He said, what, what do you mean? I said, well, how many votes did we get for and how many against? And he said, oh, no, no, it was unanimous. I said, it was unanimous. We got everyone? He said, yes. I said, that's great. Um, so I went back to Ottawa and then immediately we uh, put our season ticket uh, uh, campaign into uh, overdrive. We collected $22.5 million in cash in 10 days. We sold our media rights for tens of millions of dollars. So we put a lot of money in place in the next uh, you know, few weeks. You, you've got to make hay while the sun shines. There was a lot of enthusiasm for a new uh, NHL team in Canada. While we're doing all of this, I get a phone call. And that phone call was from the member of the Board of Governors who said, you will never, ever, ever. And he says to me, hi, Bruce, how you doing? Uh, uh, I'm okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, 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 do you, what do you want? And he says to me, do you remember that comment I made, uh, you know, the night before you got your franchise? And I said, uh, yeah, I don't think I'll ever forget that. I think I might go to my grave with that. Um, and he said, I just want to tell you that me and three other members of the board got together. And we decided to go up to every single bidder and say exactly the same thing. You will never, ever, ever get a franchise in Hamilton, in Milwaukee, in Seattle, in Portland, Houston, Tampa, St. Petersburg, whatever. We wanted to see how people would react. And the only two people who continued to lobby and press were you and Phil Esposito representing Tampa. And those are the people we gave the franchise to. Love that. So another lesson I think for your, your group, Mike, is, I know it's kind of corny, but the harder you work, the luckier you get. Yeah, that's great. I, lo I love that, Bruce. That's such an awesome, uh, that's such an awesome story. Like, I'm, I'm like so excited. I feel like I'm part of this. I feel like I'm, I'm there with you. Um, uh, well, I'm glad you said that. You know, maybe I can't do anything else, Mike, but I can talk. <laughs> wow. Uh, I've got a question for you, Ashley. Tracy sure. has a question for you. And she wants to uh, know your approach and strategy for finding those right people with the right skills, right motivations uh, that help that, you know, were, were by your side there that helped you build this. How do you find people like how, that? How do you find who? How, how do you find people uh, hmm. you know, for your team? How do you build your team, basically? How do you find those? That's right a people? really good, good question. Thank you for that question. So to me, the number one thing in life is trust. You know, when I was teaching, uh, you know, I was teaching entrepreneurship at the Telfer School of Management at the Sprott School of Business. You know, all these students are like 21, 22, 23. 
And when I would ask my students that question, they would, you know, they're young people, they would all say, well, the most important thing in life is, is love. And I, I would say to them, well, I understand that love is very important, of course. But if your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your partner, uh, you know, is fooling around with your best friend behind your back, what kind of a relationship is that likely to be? And by the time they're that age, many of them have had that experience. And they go, oh, that was bad. So uh, yes, if you don't have trust, you won't have love. And the same thing is true, I find, in teams. And so the number one thing I look for in the people that I work with today is I look for good heart. Yes, they have to have skills. Yes, they have to have education. Yes, they have to have, you know, a willingness to work hard, all of those things. But if they're not trustworthy, then you will never be able to build a team that is cohesive and can do great things. The other thing that I learned to do, um, and I'm very good at it, is hire slow and fire fast. Mm -hmm. And there's a famous story by Zappos, uh, which was built up by Tony Shea. Unfortunately, he passed away recently at a very young age. But Tony Shea built uh, Zappos into, it's an online shoe store, into a great, uh, an amazing company. And his only really differentiator was customer service because online shoe stores are online shoe stores shoe stores but he built it on a funky corporate culture and zappos had a policy that they would pay anybody who started working at zappos fifteen hundred dollars to leave the company within three months no questions asked you 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 get you get hired on you don't like it there and or you just for whatever reason you're leaving within three months they give you a check for fifteen hundred dollars goodbye they do that because of exactly what I've been talking about. You want people who are highly motivated, highly dedicated, and focused on, on the mission, and that can play in teams and work well together, that are trustworthy. If you have that, you can do just about anything else. So, uh, you know, hire slow, <laughs> fire fast. And uh, I'm really good at that. And it doesn't matter, by the way, whether it's a supplier or it's a, you know, a, a contractor, a subcontractor. Once somebody has proven that they can't be trusted, guess what? They can't be trusted. So that would be my, my answer. All right. So I came back to Ontario after a great success, and we had more success collecting uh, you know, season ticket money and, and sponsorship, et cetera. But many of you won't know who this is, but this was the premier of the province of Ontario at the time. His name was Bob Ray. And it turned out his political support was mainly in Hamilton. And he did not want an expansion franchise in Ottawa. He wanted to go to Hamilton. So he decided, he decided to oppose the rezoning of the, that, those 600 acres of land that I showed you, which were absolutely essential for uh, uh, you know, the, both the financial viability of the team and obviously the ability to build a new 20,000 seat arena. Uh, Phil Esposito is shown here, and again, many of you won't know who he is. He was a great hockey player, but he was also, uh, you know, the head of the Tampa Bay Lightning delegation. So Phil calls me up and says, he's super excited. He said, I just got a call from the governor of the state of Florida welcoming the Tampa Bay Lightning and saying, what do you need done to get the new stadium built? And how can we help? You know, we, we'll give you tax incentives. We'll give you some grants. We'll do some infrastructure for you. How's it going in Ottawa? And I said, well, I didn't get that call from the, the premier. I got a lawsuit. So the, the premier of the province of Ontario, the NDP government, the new Democratic Party government, you know, brought... Uh, a litigation against the Ottawa Senators and our land use at what's called the Ontario Municipal Board, and they tried to uh, defeat us at the board. That was a 13-week uh, hearing. I was on the stand for three and a half days being cross-examined by a very tough lawyer, but fortunately, we were able to win that uh, uh, that hearing and, and defeat our own government. So we were able to put the team on the ice in 1992. This was October of 92. Here I am in the middle. There's Randy Sexton. Uh, he eventually become, became the general manager uh, of the Auto Center. He's still active in the National League today. There's Cyril Leader, eventually became the president. And there's Rick Bonus, our first, uh, first coach for the Auto Centers. And as I said, there's me in the middle. Uh, and we did get our, our building built. Uh, it was called the Palladium back then, but it's now called uh, the Canadian Tire Center. But here's something else I didn't know then. And this is kind of why I'm telling you this story other than it's a nice story or it's a good story to tell. Um, here are the three quickest ways to get poor. Uh, get divorced, buy a horse ranch, or buy an NHL team. 
And inside the NHL, there's a kind of a, in, amongst the owners, there's a joke that goes around. The second happiest business day of your life is the day that you, you buy an NHL team. And the happiest day of your business life is the day you sell it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, you know, I only did one of those three things. Thank goodness. Uh, I didn't get divorced and I didn't buy a horse ranch, uh, but I, I did buy an NHL team. And, um, and I'll show you what happened. The Canadian dollar, uh, you know, the loony, it's called for Amer our American friends. Um, it went from about 90 cents to the U.S. dollar to about 62 or 63 cents. And our uh, NHL salaries priced in U.S. currency went from about six and a half million dollars when we started to about 84 or 85 million in the mid 2000s. So the team went bankrupt. There, it, there I was, age 54, that's 15 years ago, age 54. I had had this incredible career. You know, my, my wife and my children, my mother-in-law, you know, they, they, they pretty much had, you know, they wanted private schools, they wanted nice trips, you know, they, they had pretty much whatever they wanted. And there, there I was in 2004, 2005, everything, Mike, went away, everything. The, the house, you know, all the lands, the buildings, everything. And uh, in a sense, went broke and everything went away. Uh, so there I was at 54 uh, with a, a net worth that was highly negative. You understand what I mean? I, owed, I had no assets and lots of, uh, owed lots of money. Uh, so the question is, there I am at 54. What do you do next? And so one of the, the things I wanted to do for your class today, Mike, was I wanted to talk about taking care of yourself and your family for three generations and how to do that. Because I, I think one of the, you know, my mission in life, and this is probably my last mission uh, on earth, is, is to kind of spread the, the, the idea that there are ways to, to provide for yourself and your family, in my opinion, through real estate investing and owning your own personal business for life, that will, will help you avoid what happened to me. And uh, so my tale is a cautionary tale. Um, and, and before I get into more details of it, I wanted to also talk about the ethics of being an entrepreneur. Because I think a lot of people, my American, um, the people I coach in, in the United States, Mike, they don't have any problem with the ethics of being an entrepreneur. But many of my Australian friends, Canadian friends, I do some coaching in Sweden and the United Kingdom, they do have trouble with this. So let me just tell you what my good friend, he's now passed away, Peter Pataffi, told me and my class uh, uh, years ago. He said his priorities were, first, take care of your business. Second, so your business can take care of your family. So your family can take care of you. So you don't become a burden on anyone. Fifthly, so you can take care of other people because you have some, some resources. Sixthly, so other people can take care of your business. Big circle. And I remember when Peter came, he gave a guest lecture uh, at the Sprott School of Business. And I remember, uh, you know, uh, 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 one of my students putting up her hand and saying, Mr. Pataffi, Mr. Pataffi, sir, I think you, you made a mistake. And he said, oh, really? And she said, surely your first priority should be take care of your family. And he said, no, miss, I think your first priority should be uh, take care of your business. Um, and, and, and he said, do, do you know what the number one cause of divorce is? And she said, I guess because you don't love them anymore. He said, well, yeah, partly. But he said, I think the number one cause of divorce in Canada, the United States, it, it is the financial difficulties. If you have a creditor calling you up at two o'clock in the morning, when can we expect payment? That's real stress, stress on you as an individual and stress on your relationship. So if you can take care of your business, your business can take care of your family and then and there and you go from there. So he said, no, those are my priorities and maybe those aren't yours, but those are, are mine. And I think he was right. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about business modeling and uh, I'll, I'll show you, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Peter's story. So this is, you know, I think, Mike, I may be exaggerating here, but I think I'm the world's leading expert in business models. I, I do. Uh, now, mind you, that's pretty uh, simple. Uh, it's like high jumping six inches uh, because uh, there aren't that many people who really know much about business modeling, not really. So I might be the tallest dwarf. Um, that's probably politically incorrect. Uh, it's like high jumping six inches. So let me show you Peter's, uh, tell you a little bit about Peter's story. And, uh, and I'll show you how a business model works. It's very simple. Anybody who tells you business modeling is complicated is exaggerating. It is not. All right, so let's talk about um, uh, Peter's uh, model. 
So um, uh, Peter uh, did not have the advantage of um, a lot of education. Excuse me. Uh, I got a bit of a cold, so I apologize. Um, so he did not have a lot of education. I, I think he did finish high school, but not, not any more than that. And he wanted to get married and have a family. Um, and he didn't really have any skills. Um, and he looked around for a job. And finally, he found a job in sales. And Peter was a super charming guy. And he could talk, kind of like me, I guess. And he was a good talker. And uh, so he uh, got a job with a uh, a company that sold moving and packing supplies. You know, when you move, you need boxes and you need computer boxes and you need wardrobe boxes and whatever else. So uh, he, the president of that company said, uh, Mr. Patafi, I'll hire you as a salesperson, but I'm not gonna pay you anything. Peter said, oh, uh, but I'll give you 10% 10, 10 of what you sell. He said, well, maybe the guy will sell $100,000. So I have to pay him 10 grand, no big deal. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, Peter worked at that company. And about three years later, he gets called into the president's office. And the president says to him, uh, Mr. Patafi, we have a problem. And Peter says, uh, we, we, we do? Uh, what, what's, what's the problem, sir? Uh, uh, you're making more money than me. Um, now, if I was the president of that company, that would be a good news story. But for this particular individual, he said, we can't have that. Uh, Peter was selling $3 million of uh, moving and packing supplies and making 300 grand a year. You know, this is back in the 80s. That was a lot of money. And it'd be equivalent to maybe six or seven hundred thousand dollars a year this uh, in 2021. So <clears throat> the, the president said, I'm willing to offer you a job, you know, with benefits. And Peter said, oh, I've always wanted to have a job with benefits. Great. I can't wait. Uh, how much? And he said, eighty five thousand dollars. Peter said, well, wait a second. I'm making three hundred thousand and you're offering me a job. Oh, yeah, but I'll throw in a car and a cell phone. Maybe they didn't have cell phones, and maybe it was a pager. Um, and Peter said, well, I, I don't really think that's a good offer. C could we talk about it? No, it's take it or leave it. And Peter said, well, I, I don't really. I think I'll stay with the commission. And, uh, and the president on the spot fired him. So uh, uh, Peter's a proud man, or was a proud man. Uh, and, um, and, and he couldn't go home and, and, and tell his wife. Uh, now he had a wife and three kids and a mortgage. And he couldn't tell her he had just got fired. So every day he would get up and go to Tim Hortons for the day. That's a coffee shop in, in Canada. There's some in the United States too. Um, and so Peter thought, what the heck am I going to do? I don't really have any skills. All I know is sales and all I know is moving and packing supplies. But he had a really important insight. He understood business modeling. He wouldn't have called it that, but he understood it. And if you just bear with me. So here's, he started a company called Pataffy Inc. It sold moving and packing supplies. He went to his suppliers and said, look, um, you've been supplying this other company. Uh, would, would you consider supplying me? Because I'm going out on my own, but I don't have any money. Will you give me some terms? And uh, every one of the suppliers of moving and packing supplies, absolutely, Peter, will back you. Why did they back Peter? Because they trusted him. That, that word again, trust. And some of them gave him 180 days to pay. So that is another form of self-capitalization. Think about that. Peter could order $100,000 worth of moving and packing supplies and not have to pay for up to six months. No interest. They loved that guy. They loved that man. They believed in him. But he had another very important insight. In the other company, um, what they would do is they would work with their clients. So this is your, your business here, Pet Happy Zinc, or your business in the middle. And here are your customers. In the case of a moving and packing supplies business, your major customers are moving companies, people who move you from city to city or within cities. And they have salespeople. Those salespeople visit you know, families and others who need moves and they sell them moves. They also ask, do you need any moving and packing supplies? And virtually everyone does. So then they take the order, they give it to the packaging company. The packaging company delivers all of the packaging materials that are requested by that salesperson to the moving company. And the salesperson has to hump it over to the house. Peter said, this is incredibly stupid. So he went to all the moving companies and said, look, your salespeople sell a move to Mr. and Mrs. John Q. Public, Mr. and Mrs. John and Jane Q. Public, Fax, back in the day, faxes were the email of the day, fax me the order. 
And the taffies won't drop off the packing supplies to your company. We'll drop them off. We'll drop ship them to the customer. You'll never see it. It won't crowd your warehouse. And we'll give you 15% of everything that's that we, we sold or that you sell for us. 15%. You'll never see anything. It's just money for nothing. Peter got 97% of the movers in, in Ottawa to switch over from the other. What do you think, Mike, happened to the other company? Uh, hopefully they went under for being such they, a they, it was It was incredible. Within 18 months, wow. they were out of business, done. <laughs> and wow. I am happy about that. I'm sure Peter's in heaven now uh, clapping because, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're nice people, but sometimes not so much. And so he, with that one, one change in the business model, the, instead of having the salespeople re-deliver, the salespeople could go out and sell more moves. The moving companies could make more money and they got money for nothing, right? So that was an incredible insight. So one of the things I teach people to do, Mike, is to look at their business model and at least two dimensions on either side of the model. So the, here are the clients, the moving companies, and the clients of the clients are typically homeowners, right? So you have to understand your model on the demand side in at least two dimensions, and on the supply side, sometimes two dimensions and sometimes more. One of the great things about Walmart is that Walmart has the best supply chain management that there is out there. And I think Walmart knows how to go back all the way, really, almost to where they're pulling, you know, uh, you know, you know coal out of the ground. <laughs> Just they really understand their supply chain. Walmart, you know, knows when where and their suppliers know when more basketballs are needed in Nashville and more hockey skates are needed in in, in Ottawa. They they are famous for that, right? So you want to look at your business um, model as an ecosystem. And when people come to me with a forty-page business plan, I say, "Thank you very much for this. I'm not reading it." I want you to do a one page pictogram of a business model so that this is the engine of your business and that's all I'm ever gonna look at. I'm not reading a 40 page, you know, <clears throat> every, every business plan ever ever written has a, has a curve somewhere in there that looks, revenue curve that looks like that and a profit curve that looks like that, the hockey stick, right? I'm not interested in, in oh, we're gonna get 1% of a $100 billion market and we're gonna be a $10 million company in 18 months. That to me doesn't mean anything. This is more important in my opinion. So uh, by the way, uh, Bruce, uh, Lori was wondering if you can get a copy of this model. So I'm not, I, I think uh, we are recording this. So you are going to get access to the uh, recording of this. And I'm not sure if Bruce wants to share his uh, PowerPoint, but uh, I, I'd be happy to, um, uh, you know, um, can you do me a favor, Mike? Can you put if, if it's OK with you, could you put my email address in the chat box so people if they want to reach out to me? They can. Um, absolutely. It's, it's Bruce at BruceMFirestone.com. You got to put the M in there. Otherwise, I won't get it. So it's Bruce at Bruce mfirestone.com. I, I love to hear from students. You know, I've got former students of mine all over the world. They they drop me Christmas cards and, and more. And I, I love to catch up with uh, people young and old. Um, uh, I'm a pretty social guy, as maybe you've figured out already. So absolutely, you can have the slide deck and, and you can have the recording. Mike is, is going to put it on, uh, I think, on your Facebook group, right, Mike? Yeah, you bet. All right. So uh, yes, of course you can. So I wanted to show you one more thing. I mean, these business models are so simple, but they're very important. And before I forget, it was the business model before behind the iPhone that made Apple a $2 trillion company. It's not the iPhone, it's the business model. But I, I can't go into detail on that today because Mike is going to, you know, he'll pull out the hook and it'll- No, we're, we'll let you stay okay. all day. I, I'm, I'm no. happy. I, I'm, I'm loving this, actually. I hope so. And I really appreciate <laughs> it, but I don't want it, you know, but, uh, you know, it was the, uh, Steve Jobs understood business modeling. Uh, Sam Paul Mosano, who was the former CEO of IBM, understood business modeling. And both Steve and uh, 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 Steve Jobs and Steve uh, uh, Paul Mosano uh, spent about a third of their time on Apple and IBM business models. They, they understood it. And there are not many CEOs who get it, but there, there are some. And, and, and certainly Apple, <laughs> two trillion dollar valuation. Uh, they, you know, and, and, and Tim Cook, who's the current CEO, certainly gets it as well. So they, they spent a lot of time on this, about a third of their time at the CEO level. Um, so another thing that Mr. Patafi, that Peter figured out is he noticed how many homeowners would, would scrounge boxes. You know, they'd go to uh, the, their local grocery store <laughs> and get some used boxes. And people don't want to pay any more than they have to. But if you use used boxes from grocery stores, they come with mice, 
insects, cockroaches. They come with a lot of, you know, uh, you know, fruit flies and many other uh, things. It's not the best thing to do. So what Peter did was he would then say to these homeowners, listen, here's all your moving and packing supplies. If you want, you can bring your box, your used boxes back, and I'll buy them back from you. Very green. And so people say, oh, that's really good. It's very green. So, so you know, they'd pay a lot of money for this stuff, but then they would bring it back to Peter, and he would then clean the boxes. He'd pay something for them, uh, and he would sell used boxes. And that, sh sure enough, that became a 2 or $3 million line of business for him a couple of years later. So by looking at your business model two or three times a year, sometimes a little bit more than that, tweaking it as you go, it makes a big difference. I wanted to show you another one. This is really far out. I mean, as a, as a coach, I get asked by all kinds of people for help, and, and it's just fun for me, you know. Um, and I'm going to do this, by the way, Mike, until, you know, uh, St. Peter calls me up uh, and says, it's time, because <clears throat> I like doing it. And, you know, my dad, before he passed away, Mike said, uh, people should never retire. You might change what you do. Um, you know, I get that, but, but just to sit at home and watch TV all day, that is a bad thing. I think for people, yeah. I don't think that's good. I mean, a little TV here and there is okay. Um, so anyway, this, uh, group, <laughs> this is a small store in a small town in Ontario called the happy Buddha. They call me up. I don't know, even know how they find me, but they do. So we, we need some coaching. This is a pandemic, you know, and we, we send, uh, we, we sell eco-friendly products, uh, 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 you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, sales are not great. And what are we going to do, et cetera, et cetera. I, said, I don't know. So anyway, I talked to the guys. I did a Zoom meeting with them. They paid me a grand total of 350 bucks, I think. But I was fine with that. And it turned out in this little shop that I showed you on the slide before, they had six psychics in there doing readings. And I said to them, hmm, that's kind of interesting. I said, can you do psychic readings? I've never had a psychic reading, so I don't really know much about it, but now I'm an expert, um, you know, five minute expert. And, and so I said, can, can you do psychic readings, or, or, you know, like on a Zoom call, like we're doing? Oh, sure. Yes, we can. I said, oh, that's interesting. So I said, why don't you offer psychic readings on Zoom? And, uh, and they said, oh, we could do that. And I was lucky because the two older fellows uh, who own the store, their son, one of the, the men, uh, uh, their son, uh, his son was, was 30 and he was on the call and he really got it right away. Oh, yeah, we could do that. So I said, you know, you could put your psychics on Zoom and somebody could come along and get a half hour reading or an hour reading. And Zoom allows you, as we're doing here today, to record it. You could download that to your computer, upload it unlisted to YouTube, so only the person who had the reading, you know, it's not public, can, can have it. And that's a sort of a value-added product. And they said, that is amazing. Uh, and, and so they switched right away. And now the main line of business at this little store is psychic readings. And I said, you know, now you have a worldwide audience. You know, I mean, Zoom is, you can Zoom with, with people in, in Hong Kong. Um, and they have their own little YouTube channel going. Um, and then I said to them, and, this, and the, the young fellow, he really got it. I said, you could be a psychic reseller platform. And the older fellows maybe didn't quite get it, but certainly the young man did. He said, invite other psychics, um, you know, to, to, to put the, uh, themselves on the platform. Uh, it, you know, they can do the same thing, use your platform, and you can keep 30% of their revenues and they can get 70%. You'll be the Amazon uh, of psychic platforms. And that's what they're, they're doing now. This is a little store in the middle of nowhere that is really doing very well with, uh, and you know, people are stuck at home, Mike. And, you know, you, you, you want to hear from a psychic, you know, your love life is going to be great this year. Your business is going to boom. You're going to, you know, <laughs> you know, why not? you might as well pay, pay, you know, 70 bucks and, and have a, have a reading and figure out that everything is going to turn up uh, rosy. So one of the things about modern business models that I wanted to share with you guys is that part of the, the modern era business model is combining, uh, I call it combining this with that. Two things that appear to be unrelated at first, but when you combine them, they combine in these wonderful, wondrous new ways. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, many of you know Lululemon. They make uh, yoga clothes, for example. I, I own some yoga clothes from Lululemon because uh, my wife and I do yoga together twice a week. And she was tired of me in sweatpants. And she said, that's not going to work. Uh, so she bought me some nice clothes, very nice clothes from Lululemon. 
So last year, Lululemon bought the mirror. For those of you who don't know what it is, the mirror is something where you can do a yoga class and, and then get exposure to all kinds of really great teachers and great classes from all over the world. And you, you could be at home and, and do that. But obviously, Lululemon is going to use this as a platform to sell more clothes. So I'm sure you'll be able to, at some point, be able to stand in front of you know, the mirror and, and virtually try on uh, you know, uh, you know, some yoga clothes and just press on the mirror somewhere and they ship it to you the next day or the day after, right? So people are buying these things, you know, in the, in, in the millions uh, for 2000 bucks. That's a pretty expensive mirror, 2000 bucks. But here's the key thing. And this is another point I want to underline for the people on the call. The real reason they bought the mirror isn't just to sell more yoga clothes is that to make the mirror work, you need to buy a 39 million, sorry, 39 million, 39 US dollar a month subscription, you know, so you can get the classes, et cetera. So you pay $39 a month, about what you would pay, I guess, to join a gym club. And think about this, if they sell 10 million mirrors and 10 million subscriptions, that's $390 million a month, Three. $190 million a month in CMRR. So for those of you interested, write that down, CMRR. It's the holy grail of business. If you have a business model with CMRR in it, committed monthly recurring revenues, you just hit a home run. And uh, I'm just going to go back a slide. And when I do that, you can see here that, 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 that Lululemon stock went up by more than a third in the three months right after they bought the mirror. So people understand this, or at least some people understand it. All right, I'm gonna, uh, to, Joy's much, uh, to Joy's joy, I'm gonna switch back to a real estate model. Okay, Joy? Sounds good. All right, um, so I wanted to show you this. This is um, uh, um, a building, an industrial building in uh, Waterloo. Waterloo is a, is, is a really happening small town in Ontario. It's a very tech-centric uh, place. The University of Waterloo is one of the great universities, tech universities in the world. I, I really believe that. And uh, this is owned by a, uh, a young man. His name is Shaddy. And <clears throat> I call the model Shadillac Workspaces. I just like his first name. He's a Palestinian who's moved to Canada with his family, very entrepreneurial, a really good person. And I just liked his name. So I called it Shadillac Workspaces. You know, it's kind of a riff on Cadillac. I hope he doesn't get sued. Um, so he bought this old industrial building. We call it Shadillac Workspaces, making things happen. Because I believe in naming things and I believe in taglines. Taglines are very important. So my brand today is Prof Bruce. And my tagline is making impossible possible, right? So in branding, I think you, you need a great name and you need a great tagline. I mean, we all know Nike, just do it. Apple, think different. So when you're doing stuff, think about a good name for your business, important, and think about a great tagline. So this is a, a, an old industrial building in Kitchener, sorry, in Waterloo. And it had been on for sale for like 400 days. That's a long time, days on market, DOM, days on market, a long time for this kind of thing to be uh, on the market, especially in a super hot place like Waterloo. Houses sell in three or four days. Most, uh, most buildings sell very quickly, but this didn't. And, um, but I, when, as soon as Shaddy uh, showed me this building, he's thinking about buying it. I said, oh my God, you should buy this thing. He said, why? It's been on the market forever. It's an industrial building. And the reason that nobody wanted, guys, as you can see on this slide, is it only has 11 foot ceiling height, okay? That is substandard for an industrial building. A minimum ceiling height for an industrial building is 18, 20, 22, 24 feet. Amazon's fulfillment centers are 60 feet high, 60 feet. And Wayfair <clears throat> is talking about going to a 90 foot ceiling height because they work in three dimensions with robots, you know, stalking things. and what have you. So an uh, 11 foot ceiling height won't do. But I said, Shaddy, I want you to buy this, but with a new business model in place. So even real estate can have business models. Okay. I said, why don't you buy this thing and put in a lot of mini workshops? Um, I said today, uh, you know, with 8 million Canadians unemployed or underemployed and 30 or 35 million Americans unemployed or underemployed, everybody's got some kind of gig or side hustle ha happening, everybody. 
I said, you're going to find in, in Waterloo, you're going to find in Los Angeles, I've got uh, clients in Long Beach, California doing this model. I've got people in Phoenix doing this model. It's a fantastic model. There are gigpreneurs everywhere. So he said, I like this idea. So he did buy this building and I'll show you the, the numbers. Joy, wait till you see the numbers. Uh, um, and this is just chatty sketching out little tiny workshops. It's a long skinny building with only 11 foot ceiling height. But for the gigpreneurs, they don't really care about the high ceilings. They, they're not industrial companies in a way. They're, they're just get, they're running side hustles and gigs. So <clears throat> these are typically 800 square feet. And within a week of buying it, there he was uh, building these things. So he's, you can see they're, they're not real big. So he's just building one after the other. And as fast as he could build them, he could lease them. There's so many people who are running gigs right now out of their homes. But as these gigs become successful, uh, they, they, they just grow out of their, their, their space. You know, one lady he rented to, she was making, uh, I didn't even know you could do this. She was making furniture out of wood pallets. You know, wood pallets are used by moving companies. <clears throat> And, and she told uh, Shaddy that, you know, she had wood pallets in her living room, in her dining room, in her garage, you know, and, I mean, it was just overrunning her house. And she, her husband said, hey, it's time to move out. And she did. So it's all kinds of things. But here's the numbers. So he bought this building. Think about this, guys. He bought a, uh, an 80,000 square foot building for 1.2 million. That's in Canadian dollars for our American friends. That's like pesos. Yeah. It's not a very strong currency. It's about 78 cents to the US dollar today. So he bought this building for 1.2 million, which is about $15 per square foot because the, the, the sellers just couldn't sell it to anybody else. Nobody knew what to do with it. No industrial company was going to buy it and the sellers didn't know what to do with it. So Shaddy did. So he bought it for $15 a square foot. You cannot build a doghouse for $15 a square foot. It's about 40 bucks. You cannot build a garage for $15, it's about 85. And then he put in about $880,000 of renovations, about $8,800 per workshop for each of those workshops because they have to be. They have to be fire separated, they need electrical, they need lighting, you know, et cetera. And there's some soft costs, uh, some financing fees, some interest, some contingencies, the big contingencies because it was a, a new project. He ended up at about $2.3 million cost. Okay, this is the slide I wanted to show you. His net operating income from this building has shot up. It's just like unbelievable. It's about $1.2 million. Um, <laughs> and it gives him $1.2 million of net income on a 2.2 or 2.3 million, gives him like a 53.3%. I don't even like showing the numbers this high because it's ridiculous. It, Mike, it would be like you and me buying a house for $500,000 and being able to rent it out for like uh, $280,000 a year or something like that. Done. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. So <clears throat> we value this uh, income stream. The actual fair market value cap rate is eight and a half percent. So I want you to focus on the power of real estate again. You divide the net operating income by the fair market value cap rate to get the appraised value. You get an appraised value of this building, which I think he's going to get at the end of this year of around 14 million bucks. So it means he'll be able to refinance it just the way I did with the roller disco rinks back in the day. Probably by the end of this year, or early next year, when he's finished, he'll probably be able to pull out $7 million in tax-free cash. That's what a business model can do, whether it's Happy Buddha, uh, you know, with their psychics, or Lululemon with their mirror, or a real estate play. By the Most way, people, I've never heard of the, uh, the barf method. I like that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's my... Uh, I've never heard of barf. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's me. <laughs> you know, I wasn't going to say that in my company, but you 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 picked it up right away. It's <clears throat> so what, what I teach people to do is buy animate. Animate is a word I use for adding new revenue streams. Right. So have a good business model, add new revenue streams, rehab, renovate, rent, reappraise, refinance, rinse and repeat with other people's money. It works. Barf. Thank you for pointing that out. Um. All right, let's just move on. So I want to show you this one. You, you may remember in the slides that when I began, and I, you know, I can I can stop anytime if I'm going on too long, Mike. Oh no, no, keep going. All right, okay, because I, I I do have about another twenty minutes I'd like to go. So you remember this barn I built, which was a playpen for my kids, but now they're all in their thirties, and I have grandkids. Uh, I thought, what the heck am I going to do with an old barn that's just sitting on my property, you know, empty? <clears throat> So what I did was I said, well, if it's good enough for Shaddy, it's good enough for Prof Bruce. So what I did was I converted the old barn into 
workshops. And you can see some of the workshops uh, that uh, we built, you know, they have overhead doors and this one here, I think I rented to a carpenter. Um, and these are some of my guys putting uh, uh, stuff together. This is PJ works for me. Uh, you know, so we've got storage containers in there. We've got workshops in there. This is just uh, pictures as we were developing the space. You know, this is the interior of the barn. It's beautiful space, really. So you can see storage over here. And then we were building, uh, you know, kitchen and bathrooms and other things here, overhead loading door there. Uh, these are some of the workshops that we built. They're not fancy, but people just love them. Uh, we built quite a nice uh, bathroom here. Uh, the bathroom has a shower as well, and you'll see why that's important in a minute. Um, and so people are using these workshops for everything. I've got a carpenter in there. I've got a sailboat builder in there. I've got a young woman. She makes um, handmade soaps, and she's doing very well. Her name's Lisa, and she sells these handmade soaps all over the world through the internet, and uh, very successful, and she's using one of the workshops. And so people use the workshop and they, they use the storage and whatever else. So you get a sense of what's going on here. And uh, in April of this year, we're going to add a bunkie that looks kind of like this. Because now that I've got the barn there and I got the ponds and I got the lake, I thought, <clears throat> why don't I add a bunkie? Because some people might want to live and work, right? And, um, and these bunkies, by the way, are fully... Uh, self-contained. They've got uh, composting toilets. Uh, they, they have power. Uh, they have gray water management systems. I mean, you know, these are fantastic. And if it's successful, well, I'm going to put a bunch of them there. Now, I want to show you from an old barn that was just sitting there empty. By the time I finish uh, with the workshop leasing, and, and I have a club in there as well, uh, you know, sort of a membership thing that, uh, you know, uh, kind of a co-working space, but for makers, not for people who are necessarily typing all day. <clears throat> and I, uh, I put a bunkie rent rental there too. I can probably make about $110,000, maybe $115,000 a year from a barn. If I were just to put a barn up on, on, on the internet, you know, hey, I got a barn, anybody want to store their car in there, I'd, I'd probably make, you know, maybe I'd make, uh, you know, $500 a month, or maybe $1,000 a month, I don't think I'd get that much, but somewhere between 500 and 1000. But if you have a business model, and you understand the power of those, and you have some real estate like this, and part of the reason I did this is I need the income, just like anybody else, my family and I still work for a living. But also because, you know, uh, I don't want to be a co the coach who talks. I want to be the coach who talks the talk and walks the walk. So I said, what the heck? If Shaddy can do it and I can coach him to do it, I can do it too. So that's what I'm doing. Um, all right, let's just move on. I'm going to show you a couple of other really simple animations uh, that you can do. It's, uh, and it's for joy and anybody else interested in real estate. So animating, again, is adding revenues to, um, to, to, to real property. And I use the same kind of a term when I animate businesses like Happy Buddha, six psychics, and now a bunch more online doing uh, you know, readings. And, 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 and it is now the main line of business for the Happy Buddha. Um, so coaching right at the beginning of the pandemic, I think it was February or March, one of my clients said to me, Bruce, what would you do with $40,000 in the time of COVID-19? And I love questions like that because it forces me to kind of answer them. And this is the hottest trend, excuse me, uh, hottest trend in, in real estate today, whether you're in Shanghai or you're in Stockholm or, or Ottawa, Canada uh, or New York City, the hottest thing in real estate today is the micro suite. And the reason for that is uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, people were okay with roommates. But even before the pandemic hit, people were fed up with roommates. They were. They would rather have a small space. This micro suite that you see here is about 300 square feet. So you walk in the door here, there's a little sleeping area here, there's your bathroom there, you got a tiny little kitchen there. You've got a, an entertainment and work area here and hopefully some access to the outside. That's about 300 square feet, it's not very big. But the reason that roommates are not so popular is, is that you know I come home and if I got a roommate and I say, Mike, who drank the last beer? And then Mike comes home the next day and says, hey, who ate my, the last slice of pizza? And then somebody, Joy comes back and, and she said, Bruce, it's your turn to clean the bathroom. I said, no, I did it last week, it's your turn, Joy. Roommates are always arguing. And then the pandemic hits and you definitely don't want a roommate, especially if he or she is working in the ICU or something like that, right? You could get really sick. So this is the single hottest trend in real estate. 
and this is a, a couple. This is the couple that asked me for some help at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, Ken and Natalie, and so I went and visited their house. They live in a small town, and I want you to focus on this porch here and this glass wall that you see here. So this is their house, quite nice. And so going back here, so you go inside this glass wall, and this is what I found. So this is their living room. And it turns out this is quite a big house. They have not one, but two living rooms. I said, uh, Ken, Natalie, wh why do you need two living rooms? Oh, we don't really. I mean, this thing here, and we hardly ever use it. You know, the other living room, uh, you know, it's a split level upstairs. We use that a lot. This one hardly at all. I said, this would make a heck of a nice micro suite. And then I took a picture of the other way. So if I said to Ken, now, if you put about eight feet of drywall here, you put a micro kitchen in here and a bathroom, you've got a perfect micro suite because it has its, already has its own door to the outside and you can rent it out. And uh, this is a picture of me. Uh, you can see me reflected here and there's Ken I'm taking the picture. And so here's the little patio. So imagine you've got this cute little micro suite fully furnished, right? Um, that they could rent out and add some additional income in their principal residence. Um, so, so what happened was they went ahead and um, they, we, we, my wife and I, and, and many of my clients, we build these micro suites in lots and lots and lots of places. And they cost, you can see down here, they cost about $40,000 to build uh, properly according to the building code, including furniture. And they make about $10,000 a year net. Okay, so it's not a whole lot of money, but if you have a bunch of them, I have, I, my wife and I own a bunch of them, you know, every $10,000 that you've added that wasn't there before, that, that, that adds up if you have 10 of them, right? The cap rate, again, is stupidly high. It's like 23.5%. And again, I have to be cautious about that. But Ken called me up after he finished. Uh, he's kind of a handy guy. He said his cost for building out his microsuit was 15 grand because he did all the work himself. So I didn't want to put in a cap rate here, which would be stupid, like it would be like 60% because it's too high. Like for somebody like me who hires people like PJ and Pat O'Connor and others to build these things, it cost me 40 grand. But for somebody who's handy, maybe it's 15 or 20,000 also your cap rate is even better. But when you compare getting 23% even uh, to what you might get in your bank, which might be one or 2%, it's pretty good. So real estate is not get rich fast. You know, Mike, I get calls whenever uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad conference happens in uh, anywhere in Eastern Ontario within a few weeks or a few days, I'm getting calls. Can you find me a hundred unit apartment to buy, Bruce? It's like, here, you're really good at real estate and it has to make a hundred dollars a door after everything is paid. So I can make $10,000 a month and it has to have no deferred maintenance. It has to have great tenants, has to have great property management because I don't want to do any work and it has to be no money down. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, and, and, I, and I said, did you just go to a rich dad, poor dad conference? Yeah. And they say, how did you know? <laughs> well, I get a few of these calls. And the answer is no. So with all due respect, okay, guys, uh, men and women, uh, there, it, at least in my experience, there is no shortcut to becoming wealthy. It, at least, this is my opinion. Uh, you always read about somebody who wrote a business model on a napkin and sold it for $100 million 18 months later. That happens less often than winning the lottery. And a plan to win the lottery is not a plan, yeah. right? So if you want a plan to, to, to take care of yourself and your family for three generations, there's work involved. There's brain power involved. So when people call me up and they ask me for fantasy land, I, I say, I'm so glad you asked. No, I can't help you. And I don't coach those people either. Um, I'm gonna, this is the last one I'll show today. And then if there are any questions, guys, I, I'll stay on for a few minutes. Uh, for it. But this is something else, a new model that I've been working on for really for the last two or three years. It's called Main Street Makeovers. What the heck is, everybody knows what a makeover is. I probably need one, you know, uh, you know, a little better hairstyle, except I don't have any hair. Uh, maybe a facial, you know, get a, whatever it is, you know, better clothes, who knows, lose a little bit of weight. So, uh, but this is Main Street Makeovers. And I want to show you uh, what I'm talking about. So clients of mine in Canada, the United States are buying properties in small towns within an hour or two of major centers on main streets. They're buying these old historical buildings for not very much money. They're fixing them up, they're renovating and rehabbing them. And they're attracting people from all over, especially from the larger centers who want a better lifestyle. 
And so, um, you know, again, so that I'm not just talking the talk, but walking the talk, I think that's the expression. I bought this building here. Actually, my wife found it in Belleville. And it's a three-story building. You can see here, it's got three, three retail spaces in a grade. It's got three apartments on the second floor and six on the third floor. And this is what it used to look like in the 1970s. So it had these three retail spaces here, uh, three apartments here and six apartments here. It's on the main street of a small town of 51,000 people, Belleville, Ontario, about two hours from Toronto. Um, look at the price that we paid for it right here on the spreadsheet. We paid for this building's about 12,000 square feet. We paid $280,000 for it. In Toronto, two hundred eighty thousand dollars gets you maybe half of a garage. You know, I mean, uh, uh, one of my daughters lives in Toronto, and, and she is, and her lovely young man Patrick Kerr want to buy a house. A house in downtown Toronto, even close to downtown Toronto, is between one point seven to three million dollars for people in their twenties. Now in their early thirties, that's not easy to 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 buy. So. To, to buy a, a, you know, a, a beautiful historic building like this for $280,000 is, is pretty inexpensive. Now we're going to spend quite a bit of money uh, fixing it up. So by the time we finish the renovation at the end of this year, we'll be in for about one and a half million dollars. It might be closer to $1.6 million because we're gonna bring this building, it was built originally in 1872. We're gonna bring this building back to a really high standard. We think we'll end up with net operating income from the, you know, the, the commercial at grade and then the, the, the suites above of about $196,000 a year, which means that this building probably by the end of this year or the middle of next year will be worth about three and a half million dollars. So we're probably going to make between 1.6, 1.7, 1.8 million dollars on it, right? And it's hard to save that kind of money, right? I mean, you know, back in the day when I'd ask my students how many of them can save, you know, $500 a month, almost nobody put up their hand. And even if you know people who are good savers and somebody has saved up $30,000, quite often you look back and you check back with them a couple of years later and they had to have the new iPad, the new Samsung, you know, whatever phone, uh, you know, they, they needed a new car and their savings are gone. So I have found that you cannot save your way to wealth. Very few people I think can. You have to invest your way there. So there's nothing else you remember from this. Hopefully uh, that makes sense to you. You cannot save your way to wealth. You have to invest your way there. So by buying properties like this on, on historic uh, uh, streets and their historical buildings close to a major center like Toronto, um, I, I think it's a great model. And I've got lots of people in the United States and Canada doing this and having a lot of su success at it. So this is kind of what the building looks like uh, in, in December uh, with the Christmas lights on, et cetera. It's major renovation going on. But I wanted to show you a, a, a few photographs inside. This was um, a part of the building that um, uh, was, uh, uh, this used to be a quote unquote banquet hall for a, a, a restaurant called China Gate Restaurant. And it looked like this when we bought it, okay? So over here on the right hand side, you can see what it looked like. It was just an incredible mess. I bought this building, Mike, out of a power of sale. If you know what that is, it's like a foreclosure. And uh, I, my wife found it on a Friday. Uh, I went down on a, uh, I guess on a Sunday, uh, I went down on a Sunday to, to, you know, I'm an engineer. I did the inspection myself. I put in an offer Sunday night with a, a noon the next day, irrevocable. And uh, the lender sold us the building for 280,000 nice. bucks. I had no conditions in the offer. No, I just bought it. So this is what it looked like. And everybody said, "You, oh, this extension at the back of the building, you've got to take it down. And I said, no, I don't think so. And so uh, we have been renovating it since we closed on it in, uh, I think it was in October. <clears throat> and when we, when we pull all the, excuse my language, the SH something rather T out of this building, uh, uh, out of this part of the building, we uncovered, this is the old stables. And it's like this incredible, e extraordinary space. And we're gonna turn this space, uh, Mike, into artisan court. So, you know, artisans, you know, like, like the lady, like Lisa, who makes handmade soaps and, and uh, people who do maybe register massage therapy, whatever. Yeah, so, 
you know, so I'm excited about uh, that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I'm excited about uh, those kinds uh, of models, whether they're for personal businesses, for life, whether they're real estate or any other kind of thing. Like, uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, even, uh, you know, not for profits and charities, I coach quite a few of them. They need business models, too. Absolutely. Yeah, it's all, it all comes down to business models. I, I love your uh, creativity and uh, just your, your vision for, for things. Amazing. I, I have a question. Uh, well, if anybody else has questions, of course, raise your hand or put them in the chat box. When you, when you uh, brought the senators back, did you, um, did you expect to make money with that? Or did, was it the currency that kind of threw everything off, the, the uh, shift in the Canadian currency? Or did you buy more out of passion to yeah. bring a team to Ottawa? Well, it, it certainly was a passion, Mike. That, that's a great question. But, um, you know, I, I got to know Mike Eisner pretty well when he was the CEO of the Disney company. And uh, Mike, uh, um, uh, the, the year after uh, we got the NHL franchise for Ottawa, Mike uh, came and made an application uh, for uh, an NHL expansion franchise for Anaheim. It was the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim, which they today is just the Ducks. And uh, Wayne Huizinga, who owned Blockbuster back then, uh, also presented to the board. And I was on that committee uh, for a franchise that became the Florida Panthers. <clears throat> and um, one of the things that we, uh, as a, a member of the board of governors in that particular expansion committee, one of the questions we asked Mr. Eisner and Mike was, uh, you know, we're concerned about bringing Disney in as a partner, not because we don't admire and respect Disney, but because you have tremendous resources and you might just inflate player salaries even worse than, than they're going up now. And Mike said, no. He said, Disney is a company of great discipline, which is, he was true to his word. Uh, and we expect 22, 24, 26% internal rate of return on every investment, including this one. Mm -hmm. And so we have great financial discipline. We will be good partners and we will not, I mean, we will pay fair salaries and we'll keep pace with everybody else. We won't fall behind, but we will not inflate uh, salaries. We will not be foolish. So even large companies like that, you know, have, uh, have, have iron discipline and so do I. And I had a plan, you know, for uh, making the senators profitable. The first year that I ran that team, Mike, uh, in the second smallest building in the National Hockey League before we built the Palladium Canadian Tire Center, we made $9.6 million in earnings. So I know how to run businesses and I know how to make money. But what happened was salaries did get out of hand. Mm -hmm. And they went from 80, uh, you know, six and a half million, as I said in my presentation, to 84, 85 million about 10 years later. And don't try that in your business. You know, it's not that they're producing any more goals or any more, you know, widgets. They're, they're just, you're just paying more money. So it was a real problem for the, the team. But in addition to that, we did win the hearing that I mentioned in my presentation against the provincial government, but we lost the ability to develop the other 500 acres. Mm -hmm. So we took um, a $50 million write down on the land. We took another $30 million write down on the interchange. To this day, we are the only private company that has ever built a major interchange in Ontario at our cost. So we took hit after hit after hit by not having a friend in, in, in Queens Park in, in, in Toronto. Mr. Mr. Ray was, uh, you know, I, I don't send him any uh, happy birthday cards. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Uh, by the way, while you were speaking, I had several people text me saying that they love you and, and they're loving your presentation. And well, thank you very much for that. So everybody loved and, and as did I. Uh, does anybody have any questions uh, for Bruce? Yeah, don't be shy. These guys are- Hi, are Bruce. Great. It's Joy. Let me see if I can get my- I'll turn Oh, hi, right Joy. Right now. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I'm we should take dead. any questions from anybody living in Brisbane. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned like, you know, you lost everything with uh, the NHL team, but how did you turn that around? Like, how did you recover? Because obviously you're back investing in real estate and stuff. So how did you recover um, your business? Um, so- uh, I'll share this story with you, but um, maybe we could pause the recording. Oh, sure. Yeah, we'll do that right now. Just give me one sec. Boom. We are good. So Lupe asked, uh, what are some of the you know, basic characteristics of, of an entrepreneur? You know, the, the most fundamental thing about an entrepreneur 
uh, I think, is that he or she can create two dollars in revenue for the uh, for a dollar that any fool could could do. Entrepreneurs tend to be able to do on the revenue side and on the cost side things that are really almost like magic. You know, I used to run a, a lecture series called Magic from a Hat, where you know you you pull rabbits out of a hat. That's, I think, one of the things that I found uh, about entrepreneurs that I, I coach. And I've taught entrepreneurship at the Sprott School of Business, the Telfer School of Management. I taught at, at Hyper Island in, in Stockholm and many other places uh, at the University of California at Santa Cruz. I mean, I'm, I've been around. And um, entrepreneurs uh, are people who are able to uh, pivot on a dime, if they, if they see that somebody is doing something a little bit better than they are, they're not too proud to change. Like if, if, if I found you were doing something, Lupe, that was better than I was doing, um, I, even 2% better, I'd say, well, I'm, I'm doing that. So they're not too proud to, to change. Uh, they understand business modeling, like either intuitively like Peter Pataffi or explicitly like uh, Steve Jobs and Sam Palmazano. Um, and, and so business modeling, uh, a certain mental stance of flexibility, the ability to pivot, the, the unwillingness to, to take no for an answer, uh, you know, all of those things are, are really important. And not everybody is suited to being a, an entrepreneur. They are not. And there are many people that I coach that I think are better off uh, buying, a, for example, a franchise. Because a franchise is really not much of an entrepreneurial thing in the sense that the marketing system is there, the products and the services are there, the pricing is all there, you know, the supply chain is all mapped out. But true entrepreneurs, uh, I guess I would be one of them, uh, uh, you know, th that, is, that is a fairly small number. When I was at probably your age, uh, every, all the guys I knew wanted to be in a band. That was the big thing in the 60s, right? When I grew up, there, all the boys wanted to be in a band. And today, all the young people I know, they all want to have a gig or a side hustle, but I, I'm cautious about that. And I have an online test. It's called the ECQ test, the Entrepreneurial Culture Quotient Test. It takes about six minutes to do. And if you reach out to me, I think you've got my email address, Lupe, and anybody else, you can reach out to me. Um, it's an online test. It takes like five or six minutes to do. Uh, and you can do it and uh, send me your score and I'll interpret it for you because it's a pretty good indicator of whether or not you'll have success as an entrepreneur. So there you go. Great question. Great answer. Uh, Lori has his hand up. Yes, thank you. So first of all, uh, Bruce, I want to thank you and thank you, Mike, for bringing Bruce. I mean, this is a phenomenal presentation. I, I get tons of value of it. Mm -hmm. um, Bruce, my question to you, and that's not to disrespect the tons of years and, and, and experiences that you have, because I know it will take much more than two or three minutes, but could you maybe point just on, on the top key elements that, that you believe that is important in terms of the uh, mindset to create success, whether business or real estate or actually both places? Well, there has to be, there has to be a tolerance for risk. You have to be able to, to live with uncertainty. You have to be able to make decisions with incomplete information. So you, do you remember, uh, Laurie, that, that, that barn project that I showed you? Yes. Where I turned it into workshops and storage space. And it's really kind of a cool project and it makes money and I'm gonna add a bunkie to it so you can live and work in the same place. And if that's successful, I'll add more. <clears throat> you know, I, I might end up with $200,000 in revenue at that place. I don't know, something like that. Um, so, but, when I started, so in 2019, what I wanted to do with the barn, my original plan was to uh, create an event space in it because it's such a beautiful, it's like a cathedral, right? It's like a beautiful space. I wanted to create a, an event space. You know, one of my daughters has gotten engaged uh, and she wants to be married there because she has good memories of it from when she was a kid. I said, well, that's awesome. And she's marrying a charming Irishman who wanted a 350 person wedding. Obviously we couldn't do it last year, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. So the, the original plan wasn't what I showed you. It was to, um, it was to, to create uh, an event space. And then the pandemic hit and I thought, whoa, that's not gonna work. So I had to pivot away from that. So the second idea was to turn it into just like mini storage. 
But there's so many, many storage places in this uh, uh, part of uh, the world that there's just no demand for more. So I thought, well, that's not going to work. So I had to pivot away from that. And then finally, so that flexibility that I said to Lupe a few minutes ago is very, very important that you have to understand business modeling and you have to be prepared to pivot. When something isn't working, it just isn't working. Uh, there you go. That's my take on it. Anything else, Mike? Love that. Great, uh, great stuff. Um, any other questions before we let Bruce go here? Well, for, first of all, Bruce, uh, I want to thank you once again for being here. I'm so grateful to have you here. And uh, I, I love listening to smart people articulate what they do because it just really gets me excited too. Um, but any, any last questions before we let Bruce enjoy his Saturday? All right. Well, I guess the, you must have uh, explained things really well because these guys are, uh, they have no more questions or they're, they're scared of you. I don't know. Oh, no, no, don't, don't be scared. I'm actually quite a nice person. He's very nice. Uh, and, um, and, and reach out to me. I, I, I'm happy to hear from you. And, uh, uh, and, and again, Mike, I'm really grateful to you for giving me this opportunity and I'll see you all later. Well, I'd love to have you back here. Thanks again for spending your Saturday morning uh, with us. And, uh that was great stuff i, I loved it so all right it was to... really wonderful meeting all of you guys have a great rest of your weekend all right take care thank Bruce. you thank, care, you. Bruce. thank you so thank much you. See you thank later. you so much god bless take care aloha. stay safe everyone aloha